Good morning and welcome to our online service at the Vernon Church of Christ. Certainly appreciative of your being with us today. You can be doing so many other things, but you made the choice to be here with us this morning. Be sure to get your Bibles out as we have another time of worship this morning and study of God's Word. Again, thanks for being with us. May we begin with the word of prayer. We're thankful, Lord, for giving us another day, another day of being with you, another day of hearing from your word. Be with us, Lord, the things we say and do today will be in accordance to your will. Be with our sick and help them in their time of need and the caregivers for them. Watch over them and help them have a better tomorrow. Again, thank you for loving us and giving us of your son. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou the number one, you'll find it used quite a bit in the Bible. God likes number one, and many times it's used to show the importance of one thing, one person, one soul. A good example of this would be in Luke chapter 15. You find the lost sheep, that one sheep. The shepherd made sure the 99 were safe and went after that one sheep and brought it back to the fold. You also find the one coin, the lady lost. She sweeps her house until she finds it and she puts it back in its proper place. You also find that one pearl of great value, and how the man really cherished that pearl and wanted it, and he acquired it. And then you find other examples, maybe the one talent man. He was given that one talent. He didn't use it properly, but it was one talent. He should have used it to the best of his ability. 
So many times in the scriptures, you'll find the number one being used. What about the soul? Well, one soul is important. We certainly know that. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, the importance of one soul. Many times we look at souls as many, but yet God focuses on just that one so often. In Acts chapter 6, we find a man by the name of Philip. Here was Philip. He was a man that was given a responsibility along with six other individuals to care for some widows. He did a very good job of this. The widows were being maybe overlooked to some degree. And the apostle said, let's choose seven men. And Philip was one of those individuals that took care of that particular issue and handled it very well. But it's not long after this, there's a great persecution in Jerusalem. And because of this, as Christians scatter, they go in every direction. And Philip is one of them. And Philip finds himself in Samaria. And while he is there, he begins to teach to people. He understood the importance of teaching God's word, and, and he did that very thing. He had the ability to do miracles, and because of that, he did many miracles. And by doing so, it convinced the people that he was from Christ. His words were true. And in doing so, there were many that listened. There were many that became Christians. Let's look at what the Bible says about this in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes of one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Also Acts 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So as we can see here, Philip was having much success there in Samaria. Men and women were being baptized. He was teaching the word of God. And, oh, he was the man for the job. There's no doubt he was the right man at the right place doing a great job. But then after he's doing such, such a great job, it is then that an angel comes to him and gives him further instructions on what to do. And look what the angel says to him in Acts 8 and verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, and this is desert. All of a sudden, having a great work, many conversions, the angel pulls him away. I want you to go to Gaza. I want you to go there. It's a desert place. Well, Philip does exactly what he is told. He doesn't question why I should go or what's going on down there. He just goes in that direction. He knows it's a desert place. He doesn't know what to be looking for. He just goes in that direction. And while he is going in that direction, there comes a chariot. He sees a chariot approaching him. Does he know what it's about? Well, not yet, because he has told instructions on what to do concerning that chariot. In Acts 8, verses 27 and 28, look what is said here about Philip and that chariot. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So here's Philip on the road. Here comes the chariot. And this the spirit says to him, go to that chariot. Well, he takes off. He's got to run to catch up the chariot. And when he gets close to the chariot, along beside that chariot, he hears reading. He hears a man reading from Isaiah chapter 53. He is reading from the prophets there about Christ. Well, this catches Philip's attention. And in doing so, he is wanting to gain more knowledge of what this man is reading. Does he have any questions? And then look what is said in Acts 8, 29 through 31. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So Philip does. Run alongside the chariot, having this conversation, I guess. Do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I unless somebody guides me? Well, the chariot stops. Philip gets in the chariot. They continue on their way, and he begins to teach Jesus. You notice this man was reading out loud. 
That's what got Philip's attention as to what he, something was going on. How many times do we read out loud? Probably been a while, maybe since elementary school or high school that we were asked to read. But this man was reading out loud from Isaiah, and it got the attention there of Philip. And he gets in the chariot, and there he begins to teach. It very well could be that Philip had the gift of prophecy. He had miraculous gifts. We know that from back in Acts chapter 6. But it could be he had the gift of prophecy to be able to explain the scriptures, explain those Old Testament prophecies and what they meant and how they were fulfilled. Very well could be that's what he was doing, using that gift in the chariot with this Ethiopian. It could also be that Philip had the gift of tongues. I don't know what tongue the Ethiopian man spoke, but I know if Philip had the gift of tongues, he could easily speak in his language and communicate very easily. That's what the gift was about and what it was for. So very possibly here, two gifts that were used while teaching this man, this Ethiopian. And Philip does it very well. Well, as they're traveling, I'm sure there are questions that are asked. And Philip makes sure this man knows who Jesus is. This, he makes sure the Ethiopian understands the, the condition of his soul and the importance of being saved. Because look what we read in Acts 8, 36 through 38. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. So in the part of this teaching, Talk, teaching about Christ, top baptism comes up. Philip here tells him what it's about, what it's for, the necessity of it, everything concerning baptism. And at some point here, the Ethiopian says, well, here's water. What's to keep me from being baptized? Philip asked him, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And he said, yes, I believe he is the Son of God. He stopped that chariot. Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water, and there he was baptized. A great day. Philip understanding the importance of one soul. No one else around here probably. And, and yet here's one soul obeying the gospel. How great it is that Philip was sent in that direction. Well, look what happens after they come up out of the water. In Acts 8 and verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Philip is called to another direction. Go this direction now. He doesn't continue with the Ethiopian, but the Ethiopian man is happy. He's rejoicing. And I'm sure that when he got home, he began to tell others the great news. He could understand Isaiah chapter 53. He began teaching others, converting others. A great day this man had as he was being taught. Again, the Ethiopian man, one soul, and the importance of that one soul, who knows how many he converted in his own country. You now, sometimes when we think about conversions, we have big numbers. Like in Acts 2, we think of the 3,000 that became Christians that day. Or it may be in Acts chapter uh, 4, we find 5,000 that became Christians. Or it may be other times, as we read in Acts, where one is taught and, and the entire family or the household is converted such as the Philippian jailer or the household of Cornelius. All those are good examples of, of other individuals, many maybe in that case being converted. But may we never forget about the one individual, the one soul, because that one soul matters to God. That's how important our salvation is, that one soul. And let's never overlook the one individual thinking that, well, one is important. I should be going after many, but that one, as we know, is important. If you ever had the, the pleasure, the honor of teaching someone how great it is that they become a Christian after you taught them, or it may be that you sort of took that individual and you, and you put them in the hands of somebody that could teach them, either way, that's great because you had a hand in teaching those individuals. And that's a wonderful feeling to know that because of your efforts, because of how you value one soul, you want to make sure that they got taught. You're the one that taught them, maybe, or you're the one that put them in a direction that somebody could teach them. That certainly is a great feeling. But there's also another great feeling that goes along with that. 
You take, for example, maybe you teach that individual, they become a Christian. They're faithful. They're doing many things in service to God. And then one day you find yourself at their funeral. That's a very sobering thought there. You're there at their funeral. And has it ever crossed your mind that, you know, here they are. They're in paradise now because of a small part that you had in this. You took the time. You saw the value of one soul. And you said, I want to teach this individual. Or put this person in contact with somebody that can teach them. That's the value of one soul. And think about that, how now they are enjoying the great paradise, and that one day they'll be enjoying heaven. Again, that's a very sobering thought. If you think about it, you had a, a hand, a small part maybe, in making sure that person learned the truth and obeyed it. I remember it wasn't too long ago, a couple of months ago, I guess now, at the funeral hall, a man had recently died. He was a Christian man. And there, thinking about his obedience when he became a Christian, I talked to another individual that was there, and I said, isn't it a great thing that you went to this house one day and knocked on his door? And he thought about it, that's right. If he hadn't gone to this man's house, took the time and saw the value in one soul, and they talked with him, and this individual became a Christian that very same day. I'm not sure how many were with him. I wasn't involved in that particular study, but it doesn't matter as long as the man was tall. He was tall, and he became a Christian. And that very day, I said to this individual, it would be a whole different situation right now if you hadn't gone to his door. And he agreed. Here's a Christian man, a faithful man and in paradise, waiting for a time to go on into heaven, all because somebody understood the importance of one soul. Well, that's what we've got to do as well. We've got to understand the importance of that one soul and what it means to them to teach them. And one day, when they go over to the other side, the blessings that will be there. God wants all to be saved. There's no doubt about it. He's, in, he's in wanting everyone to hear the truth and become that Christian. Look what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires everyone to be saved. If God desires it, so should we. We should have that same desire one person at a time. You know, most studies, most conversions, they don't come in great numbers. They come one at a time. We talk with the person, we study with that individual, they become a Christian. That's the way generally it works, one at a time. So we think about the value of that one soul. What about that coworker who sort of gets on your nerves at times? You know that individual? He has a very valuable soul, soul or she does. Or what about the family member who is the black sheep of the family? That individual has value. Their soul is valuable. Or what about that neighbor maybe who is sort of annoying? That soul has value. What about some politician that you can't stand? That individual's soul has value. Or what about that criminal who's doing time in prison? His soul has value as well. To God, all souls have value. And we need to understand that and take it serious as how God teaches us this many times in the scriptures. Take, for example, these verses here. Matthew 6 and verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Matthew 10, 31. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than the many sparrows. In Matthew 12 and verse 12. How much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? These are just three of many verses that show the value of our soul. And we need to take these verses seriously and think about the souls of others if it be just one at a time. You know, that man in the chariot, the Ethiopian, there was one soul there. But who knows how many other individuals this man taught when he got back home. Philip was sent to meet him. Philip taught him. He became a Christian, went on this way rejoicing. We need to understand the value of the soul, especially when it comes to our soul. Look what the writer says, Christ says in Mark 8 and verse 36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We have many things in life that are of great value. Things of the past, things of the present. Who knows what the future holds? But all those things combined 
has no thought as being as important as our own soul. It is our soul that's going to live on after death. After this body decays and returns back to the earth, our soul is going to live on. And it's going to live on in one of two places. There with God or there in the devil's hell. We want to make sure that we are with God when that time comes. To make sure we are right. Too many times people don't really consider the value of their soul and then it's too late. Nothing they can do to change it after death. If you're not a Christian, why don't you consider becoming that child of God this morning? Understand how valuable your soul is and that your soul is going to live on. And a thousand years from now or 10,000 years, if the world still stands, you're going to be alive. Your soul is going to be alive and it's going to be in one of two places. Why not make sure it's there with God? Why not make sure it's there? If you're not a Christian, why not listen to the great words of the Bible and become that child of God? By hearing the great word that Christ has given to us in the Bible, by repenting of your, believing that, that Jesus is the Son of God, John 3 and verse 16, then repenting of your sins, as Luke 13, 3 says, confessing his great name just as, as that Ethiopian man did, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and being baptized in the Christ. Acts 2 and verse 38, just as the man of Ethiopia did. And you too can go on your way rejoicing, knowing that my soul is right with the Lord, I'm living a faithful life, and how great it will be. Maybe as a Christian you see that you've been neglecting your soul. Again, that's not a good thing. We never know when it'd be our last day on this earth. If we can help you to make things right with God as a Christian, give us a call. There you see the number at the bottom of the screen. Let us help you. We'll get back with you as soon as possible and, and help in any way possible. If it be to become a Christian or to come home as an unfaithful Christian or one that just needs to talk, needs prayers. Either way, this would be just great. So give serious thought about the, your soul and, and the condition it's in right now. Thank you for being with us today. I hope today's message will show us the importance of one soul, especially our own soul, and make sure that we are right with God. At this time now, let's close in a word of prayer. Well, thank you, God, for your word and how it shows us the value of a soul, the value of our soul. And help us, Lord, to take it very serious and make sure that we are right with you because we never know when that day will come when we'll face you in judgment. Help us all to understand the love you had for us and sending of your Son to make possible our salvation. Again, be with our sick. Help us all as we travel through life. Be with our nation. Help us, Lord, until we meet again. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask all these things. Amen. preparation for the Lord's Supper, we'll be reading Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let us pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we we'll thank you for your son Jesus and giving of his body. May our minds go back to the cross, the suffering that he did there for us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Again, let us bow as we give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Again, our Father, we thank you for Jesus' blood he shed on the cross for us. May our minds go back to the cross for every drop he shed. For us in your Son's name we pray. Amen. We're also commanded to give back on the first day of the week as we have prospered this week. Acts 20 verse 7 says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Let us give thanks. We well, thank you, Lord, for every blessing you send our way. Be with us, Lord, as we give back to your work of the church. We do so with a cheerful heart. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Blow in the grave, lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus. church building at, at the 930 or 1045 hour. We'll be there live and having our worship in person. We'd love to have you there. We'd love to see you. How wonderful it is that we can come together and hopefully the time is coming very soon that we can all come together at one time instead of having to divide our services up. We're also starting back this Sunday our 5 o'clock service and also the following Wednesday our Wednesday evening service as well. If you can be with us there as we come together at the church building for a time of study, a time of worship, a time of fellowship, how great it is for that to be. Thank you for being with us. Look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, may God bless. <laughs>